Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I'm wearing my headphones because there's so much background noise here. Hopefully this cancels it out. Um, and this was going to be a live Zoom. Sorry, Mother Nature decided not to cooperate. I'm actually recording this in between storms. So um, forgive me for not being live. There is a way to ask me questions if you wish, okay? Um, today's topic is how childhood trauma changes the brain. Since I became an AFT practitioner and began my journey learning about the brain, how it functions, how to survive trauma, I've done a lot of extra research, continuing education, studying, asking questions. Even so, it was quite a surprise for me to find out how childhood trauma actually changes the brain. I mean, it physically changes the brain. And it can affect not only our mental health, but also our physical health, even decades later. That was foreign to me. I didn't understand how that could be true, especially since I had long ago put all those memories in a little box, locked it, and stuffed it down deep inside myself, never to be thought of again, or so I thought. It didn't occur to me that as I was rehashing these memories, which had just popped up out of nowhere, I was also reliving them in the present with all the emotional baggage because I hadn't properly resolved them. Heck, I didn't even know how to do that. I mean, no one teaches us at school, right? Our parents don't teach us. We don't learn it in public school or high school. So, I did the best I could. I just kept chucking them in the box, which became more and more difficult every time I had to do it, but, but I did it over and over and over again, only to find out that sometime, somehow, that lock had been picked, and there they were again, those horrible memories storming into my brain and my emotions. Why did this keep happening to me? Is it the same for everyone else? Do they keep rehashing those disturbing emotions? The answer is yes. It turns out that childhood trauma leaves its indelible mark on the brain. In fact, it even creates a chemical imbalance in our bodies that ultimately goes to the brain and kills, yeah, you heard me, kills our neurons. It physically changes our brain. Incredible, right? Okay, so before I go any further, I wanna make sure that we're on the same wavelength here. We, I'm pretty sure everybody knows about neurons and that they're in the brain and, and that kind of thing, but, what exactly are they? How do they work? How do they function? Why do we need them? And why is what I'm going to talk about later on so important? Especially the part about killing them, right? So I want to read you uh, part of an article that talks about what neurons are. It's a little bit technical. So, you know, bear with me for a minute or two while I read this, I promise when it's done, there's no more technical mumbo jumbo, okay? This article is called, and I'm gonna read it here, 
Brain Basics, The Life and Death of a Neuron. And it comes from the website www.nindsnih.gov. So here's the technical stuff. The central nervous system, which includes the brain and the spinal cord, is made up of two basic types of cells, the neurons and the glia. Now, the glia outnumber the neurons in some parts of the brain, but the neurons are the key players in the brain. Neurons are information messengers. They use electrical impulses and chemical signals to transmit information between different areas of the brain and between the brain and the rest of the nervous system. Everything we think and feel and do would be impossible without the work of neurons and their support glial cells. Neurons have three basic parts. They've got a cell body and two extensions called an axon and a dendrite. Now within the cell body is a nucleus, which controls the cell's activities and contains the cell's genetic material. The axon looks like a, like a long tail and transmits messages from the cell. The dendrites look like the branches of a tree and receive messages for the cell. Neurons communicate with each other by sending chemicals called neurotransmitters across a tiny space called a synapse between the axons and the dendrites of adjacent neurons. There are three classes of neurons. We have the sensory neurons that carry information from the sense organs, such as the eyes and the ears, to the brain, okay? Motor neurons control voluntary muscle activity, you know, moving your muscles, such as speaking, and carry messages from nerve cells in the brain to the muscles. All the other neurons are called interneurons. Scientists think that neurons are the most diverse kind of cell in the body. With these three classes of neurons are hundreds of different types, each with specific message carrying abilities. How these neurons communicate with each other by making connections is what makes each of us unique in how we think and feel and act. Okay, enough of the technical stuff. <laughs> I'm not gonna get all scientific on you and talk about all different chemicals and reactions and things. But what I do wanna say is those of us who have experienced childhood trauma and haven't been able to process it and resolve it, actually have smaller brains because of the chemical overdrive murdering our neurons. Our gray matter, yes, even our white matter is smaller than normal. Now, don't be getting all upset over this. There is good news. First, not everyone responds to childhood trauma the same way. Some of us have another chemical overload that actually protects us from the ones annihilating our neurons. Also, even though it was previously thought that once the brain is created, it remains the same except for the neurons dying, of course. 
research has now proven that we can and do produce new neurons and they're created automatically. In other words, we don't have to do anything special to make it happen. Yay! But, and there's always a but, isn't there? If you still haven't resolved those unhappy childhood memories and dissolved the attached adverse emotions, the original overload of chemicals will still be running free and will kill off those shiny brand new neurons as they are created. So now we have adverse early childhood memories and emotions killing off neurons. But wait, when we become teenagers, there's another reduction of neurons, but it comes about naturally. What? We're going to lose more? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we will. But luckily, we were born with an excess of neurons, meaning we have way more than we actually need. This is so we have the right ones to support us later in life in our choices of the things we love to do. For instance, do you love math but hate sports? You'll keep the neurons that support your ability to learn and execute complex math problems, but discard the ones that would support taking part in sports. Can you still do sports? Sure. It just might not be as easy for you, or you might not be as good at it because you've lost the connecting neurons to facilitate sports and muscle activity. Do you love learning new languages, but you kind of hate gardening? You'll keep the neurons that support learning and speaking in new languages while tossing the ones that you would use to better your gardening skills because you don't need them anyway. In this way, we are able to house clean our brains, retaining the neurons that support and provide value while discarding the ones that don't. It's a natural attrition and one not to worry about since it happens to us all in order to make our lives easier and happier. It allows us to focus on the things we love or need to do without worrying about the things we don't. I mean, if we had everything bombarding our brains all the time, we'd have great difficulty focusing and or performing our daily activities. So this natural attrition is actually a good thing. Besides, as I mentioned before, we were born with lots of extra neurons in anticipation of losing some to this natural process. But, there's that word again, but when our early childhood memories cause the helter-skelter loss of neurons too, with no consideration as to which ones we should keep or discard, then guess what? Our brains become smaller than normal, which can result in difficulty learning, forgetfulness, can eventually lead to dementia and Alzheimer's later in life. Now, as if that wasn't enough, because this overload of chemicals is chronic, meaning it's happening all the time, it's they begin to attack other areas of the body as well. It's been known for decades that early childhood trauma is linked to causing physical illness later in life. Things like fibromyalgia, disc degeneration, high blood pressure, cancer, leaky gut, kidney disease, panic attacks, autoimmune diseases, scary, right? 
how many people do you know who suffer from any of those or some other chronic illness? How many people do you know who suffer from daily chronic physical pain? You see, when we are constantly in the fight, flight, freeze mode due to adverse experiences, we're always on high alert. We're always tense. We always feel stressed. Our muscles tense up. Our emotions run amok. We overreact. We're always waiting for the next bad thing to happen, waiting for the next shoe to drop. Our body is always in limbo, wondering if we're safe or unsafe. Should we stay? Should we run? What should we do? So what can we do about all of this? How can we ensure our new, newly created neurons get to live? How can we prevent, reduce, or heal chronic illness and pain? I'm Marg Rakoski, and I've been dealing with chronic pain for decades. Trust me, it's no fun. When you talk about pain levels from zero to 10, with zero being no pain and 10 being the worst possible pain, I was in the eight to 10 range, depending on the day. I could barely walk with a cane, sometimes one in each hand. And I had to physically drag myself through sheer determination up the three lousy steps to get to the bathroom. There were times I even had to get my husband to help me get out of bed in the mornings. I spent almost all my time in a lazy boy chair because that was the only place I felt some comfort. I tried everything. I, I, I tried ice, heating pads, chiropractic, hypnotherapy, massage therapy, Bowen therapy, acupressure, acupuncture, floral essences, essential oils, even swallowing some gross stuff from the naturopath. I changed to a gluten-free diet. I gave up coffee and alcohol. I was told to rest. I was told to exercise. I joined a gym and had a personal trainer, but ended up in even more pain and eventually an injury. My doctor said I had to quit going to the gym. Now, before you think I was just lazy and sat around all day like a bump on a log and that's how I got to be where I was, let me just tell you a little bit about my life. First, I'll start with activity and then I'm going to go into trauma. So as a child, I was extremely active. I rode my bike everywhere. I walked a lot. I mean, if I wanted to go somewhere, I didn't take a bus. Why would I spend this little tiny bit of allowance money on a bus to go somewhere when I wouldn't have any money to spend? <laughs> so I walked, sometimes even five miles or more, just to do what I wanted to do. I played outdoors day in and day out. I started gardening when I was about eight years old because I wanted my house to look nice. But nobody was doing anything except cut the grass. So I did, I started gardening. I made it look nice. I participated in sports until I was injured. After marriage, my husband and I bought a farm where I grew a huge, I mean huge, vegetable garden, providing food year round with preserves and frozen produce. I cultivated, watered, harvested, prepared all the fruits and veggies we needed for the whole year. I rode horses. I enjoyed hiking, camping, canoeing, kayaking, fishing, wildlife photography, and I pursued an a career in art, selling my original artworks, teaching, creating and running one and two week workshop retreats for famous artists 
at prestigious resorts. I didn't hire anybody to help me. I did it all. We bought all kinds of farm animals, which I looked after while my husband was working away from home for weeks at a time. As the kids got a little older, they started to help as well. <laughs> I lifted too many heavy things like bales of hay and pails of water for the animals. I volunteered at the local school three days a week. During that time, I also became a baseball coach for the kids team, a brownie leader, a beaver leader, a Cub Scout leader, and I ferried the kids to swimming lessons, games, and karate lessons. I went back to school part-time. Now, here's where I start with a little bit of trauma, okay? This is how it starts. When I was very, very young, about two years old, I fell off a sled that was careening down an icy slope and hit my head. I was knocked unconscious. A little bit later in life, still a child, I fell off the top, the very, very top, like not, not three steps down, not part way down, but the very, very top of a slide, fell down right off the top, hit my head and was knocked unconscious. I've fallen down, I don't know how many flights of stairs. I don't know how many times. I've fallen off horses. I've been in several vehicle accidents, none of which were my fault, by the way, but still, I was in them. I was often ill with one thing or another, and even went through a couple surgeries as a child. Added to all of that, during my childhood, there was a lot of emotional and physical trauma in my home with a dysfunctional family. My aunt came to live with us when I was about, no, oh, I don't know, four or five. Now, she had mental illness, including schizophrenia and multiple personalities. I was too young at the time to understand any of that, even if they had told me, which they didn't. Um, I knew she was different. I knew she had different voices at times, but the thing that affected me the most was the part about her being very violent, sometimes beating my mother and grandmother without warning. I was in constant fear of her burning the house down or killing my parents while they slept. I had recurrent nightmares of witches chasing me. One time when my aunt was beating my mother, my father stepped in, placed his hands around her neck and choked her until she turned blue, almost killing her. My grandmother, who also lived with us, ran out into the street in terror, screaming for the police. No one came. My mother was another story. She seemed to enjoy humiliating me in front of family and friends. And she afforded me absolutely no privacy, not even in the bathroom or the bathtub. I stopped bringing friends home after school. My father, told me I was his soul mate. I had no voice to speak up against my parents. They were the rulers, supreme rulers. Children were expected to obey or there would be consequences. No discussion, no argument, no eyes rolling, no sighing, nothing or else. I was teased and bullied at school. 
because I only had outdated hand-me-down clothing. Until one day, I finally just gathered the courage to stand up for myself, heart racing like crazy in my chest and ready to pass out at any moment. I was unable to confide anything to my mother because nothing could possibly be wrong. The first time I tried, she just laughed at me. So guess what? I never tried again. I could not trust her, which then led me to having trust issues with others. After all, if my own mother laughed and didn't care, what made me think anyone else would do differently? So I became the fixer. I handled everything that ever bothered me all by myself. I was my own therapist, even though I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I just locked up all my crap in that box inside myself and threw away the key, or so I thought, and got on with my life. I mean, isn't that what you're supposed to do? Get on with life as though nothing has happened? Hmm. I had no idea then what havoc would occur later in life. Fast forward several years. It all started with asthma. Then came kidney disease, fibromyalgia, osteoarthritis, disc degeneration, and more. It's the body's way of saying, whoa, stand up and take notice, something's wrong. And if we don't do something about it, guess what? Things get worse and worse and worse until we're in such misery, we have to take action. A friend introduced me to AFT, which I kind of thought might be some mumbo jumbo woo woo thing. But I had tried everything else, so why not? She and I did several sessions together, and it was then I realized that AFT was, in fact, the best thing for me since sliced bread. I mean, I felt so light, so free, so happy. All the weight had been lifted from my shoulders. I knew I had to pursue this avenue, not only for myself, but to help the hundreds and thousands of others who were going through their own health and emotional issues. And just in case you're like me and thought it was mumbo jumbo woo woo stuff, it actually isn't. It's based on science and research and was created by a licensed psychologist in practice for over 20 years. It was while he was working in EMDR that he discovered he could use the sense of smell to easily access the limbic system of the brain where all our emotions and memories are processed. Eureka! So now I've become an AFT practitioner constantly furthering my knowledge with research and studying. After I read about childhood trauma being linked to chronic pain and disease later in life, it all clicked in. It all finally made sense. Here's an interesting fact. The body doesn't care where the trauma comes from, whether it's mental, physical, emotional, chemical, environmental, or even if it's major or minor trauma, it all causes stress. And the body has only one stress response, which in a way is good because we can fix that. Now, before we go any further, I wanna caution you about something. Don't go about blaming all your problems on someone else whether it's a parent, a spouse, a sibling, a friend, etc. Just remember, 
even though they may have caused your emotional turmoil, they've likely been through some adverse events themselves and they're doing the best they can. They have upsetting memories and emotions and sometimes they have trouble dealing with them just like you and I. Their words and actions come automatically from deep within their own trauma and they likely don't even realize they caused you distress. Forgive them for this is also a key component to healing yourself. It doesn't mean you agree with what was done or said. It just means that you're finally going to stop hating them and feeling guilty, ashamed, humiliated, depressed, angry. It doesn't mean you have to spend time with them. They don't have to be your best friend. It just means you're freeing yourself from those burdens that you've been keeping and carrying all these years. Now, this is crucial to your own healing. So do not bypass it. By the way, it takes more energy to be angry and upset than it does to be happy. So the byproduct can also be more energy. Anyway, now that I knew why I experienced such physical pain and kept reliving the emotional pain, I was finally able to help myself. I learned about AFT, which is an acronym for aroma freedom technique. And I used that to eliminate all those horrible emotions that kept swimming around in my head, my chest, my whole body. Am I done? Not yet. Just like everyone else, my life is a work in progress. I mean, I didn't get here overnight. It took a lifetime. Healing is a gradual process, like peeling the layers of an onion. But AFT has been a complete godsend to me. It has given me back my life. Before AFT, I suffered sadness, guilt, shame, humiliation, depression, anger, grief, and more. But now, using AFT, those negative emotions are almost all gone. I am so much happier and freer. Oh, I love feeling free. I have more patience. I am more caring because I know what life was like and what it's supposed to be like. The horrible weight and pressure have been lifted from my shoulders and I feel loved and like I belong here. I am worthy of good things and so are you. If you have a similar experience, I'm here for you. I can help you with AFT so you too can regain the happiness and good health you deserve. Just send me a message at Hello at withmarg.com. That's hello at w i t h m a r g dot com, and use a f t in the subject line so it doesn't get lost. I get hundreds of emails every day, but if I see a f t in the subject line, I can pinpoint it and give your message preference over others. Now, because you stuck with me right to the end, I'm offering all new clients a 50% discount for a single session valid until midnight, July 26, 2021. Now, you don't have to physically do the session by then, 
but you do need to schedule and pay for it by then to get the discount. Please use AFT half off in the subject line when you email me at hello at withmark.com. I accept PayPal for your safety and convenience. Canadians can also do e-transfer if they prefer. Want to chat first to see if AFT is right for you? Email me your phone number and I'll give you a call, US and Canada only, please. I will not schedule a session with you unless I know that I can help you. Sessions last anywhere between 45 minutes and two hours. In the very rare case, a session may last longer. But I only charge by the session, not by the hour. Some practitioners do charge by the hour, but I want to make sure that you know upfront what your cost is with no hidden surprises. Now we all know there are no guarantees in life. For many, eliminating the emotional distress is sufficient to effect a reduction or possible remission of pain or illness. Whether that happens to you or not, at least you'll finally be free of the past and able to experience happiness and lead a more joyful and productive life. Take care, my friends. I'll be thinking of you and hope you'll drop me a line, even if just to say hi or that you enjoyed this video. I sincerely hope I've touched your heart, even in a small way, and that you find peace and contentment. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and share. Also, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and click on the bell to get notified of new videos as they are available. Feel free to share this video with friends and family. Also, I invite you to join my Facebook group. I will put the link in the comments. Please check out my website at www.withmarg.com and sign up for newsletters to know when new blog posts are published. See you soon.